bad because the real mo modern history is to get to this final stage. Yes, Marx would say you're absolutely right. Once the, the proletarian revolution is raised, we will be in the land of human rights. But we won't actually need these words for our human rights anymore, which protect individuals, which protect particular communities, because we won't have these divisions. It won't be Christians against Jews or, or Protestants against Catholics or Chinese against anyone else, because in, the, international, the working class is an international, stateless, a boundless, boundless movement. So all these divisions that you might imagine when you go around the campus now, all these divisions will disappear. Once people get that it's not race that matters, it's not gender that matters, it, what matters is a single fact that, we will, that we, history is pushing in this direction, which is a classless society in which humans will have overcome dearth and will become truly who they are. That's, you, there's a famous book came out recently called The End of History by Fukuyama. It's, it speaks to this notion. He thought this was happening with the end of the Cold War, which it didn't. But, so this is, a, this is a theory of history, a motor of history. What moves history forward? It's this. So in the Marxist view, we, it, in some sense, um, put it this way. I, I, I don't think I, if I mentioned it, Hegel, the, the, the person whom philosophically Marx, Marx got a lot, but who actually thought it was kind of um, ideals that, conflict of ideals that move history rather than material, thought, saw Napoleon once more on a horse in, 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 in central Germany, in Jena, and he said, there is a spirit of history on horseback. As I say, the French Revolution incorporated Napoleon on horseback, represents the movement of history. Well, others then said, no, actually, Stalin is the spirit of history on horseback but a different stage in history. Okay, so let's look at the, Russia, the case of the Russian Revolution. Well, Russia had had a, a revolution in 1905 um, in which the, the last uh, absolutist regime in Europe, that is to say the Tsarist regime, um, agreed to a, a parliament, a not very powerful parliament, but a parliament nevertheless. And then in early 1917, it had a second revolution, which in some sense is sort of a left bourgeois revolution, if you will. Um, a socialist revolution, but not, um, but not a, 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 a radical a communist uh, re revolution. So, here we have Russia having had a revolution, and it's done. And in March 1917, one could argue that, Mar that Russia is where France was in 1789. It had had its bourgeois revolution, and now history has to catch up. Because we know, from what I just told you, Right? What I just told you, that the revolution is going to come from a proletariat. And it's going to come in an industrialized, urbanized country. But Russia was not that sort of place. Russia was far from that sort of place. Russia had begun industrialization very late. Um, it uh, really, in the 1890s, it began to have very rapid economic growth. But it really, it was quite localized, very large factories. Um, in a small number of, of, of cities uh, that were, that were uh, manned, um, in some sense womaned, um, by peasants who had been moved into the city and who lived under an extremely brutal uh, labor, labor regime, particularly in St. Petersburg, uh, some sense in Moscow, um, other cities along the, 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 the Baltic coast of, of Russia. So um, this was an unlikely place for revolution, and furthermore, it was, on the side of this, it was over 80% peasants. And these were, very, these were not rich peasants, these were poor peasants. These are guys that are wearing clogs, they are wearing wooden shoes. This is, this is not an industrial society, and this doesn't look like a revolutionary class, does it? If you think about this, of this, of this, of this, of this notion. And they live in these sort of primitive, you know, log, log, log houses. Um, these do not look like your idea of a working of a, of, a, of a proletariat that's going to storm the barricades and make and make a revolution, and indeed they by and large didn't. Now, if you just look another indicator of the of the Russian of the Russian story, look at these railway networks. This just gives you a, a very quick um, uh, satellite eye view of economic development. So we start in England, where there's an extremely heavy network of of, of railroads railroads. And then, as you'll see, when you get further to the east and further to the south, and certainly to the Middle East, it becomes much more attenuated. 
to the time in Russia, there are relatively few uh, railroads. This was actually sort of late. This when the Trans-Siberian Railroad was already well underway. This is like 1920. So in 1917, there'd be even, even less of this. So you see, this is the industrial part of the world. And this is the non-industrial side part of the world. This is not where the revolution should be happening by Marx's, Marx's story. And by the story that's the backstory for the book that the story you're getting. Because remember, again and again, he keeps saying, look, we don't have the luxury of sitting around. We need to sleep. OK. So that makes I'm sorry, it's 1903. So they started the Trans-Siberian Railroad, but it didn't go all the way over yet. But you see how few railroads there are in the territories of Russia and the Soviet Union, and incidentally also in Eastern Europe. OK. So what happens? Well, what happens is in October or November 1917, depending on which there's a calendar change. What happens is um, there is a, there's a great deal of revolutionary unrest. Um, there's a sailors and soldiers mutiny um, in, in, a, in, 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 in the port on the, on, on, on the Baltic. There are major strikes in St. Petersburg and, and in Moscow. Um, and the earlier revolutionary regime, call it the liberal left revolutionary regime, falls. And now what? One possibility as is always the case in revolution, is counter-revolution. So there was still there were a large aristocratic class. There were lots of people with interests in maybe going back to the old order. The other version is to seize history and move it forward, or so it was understood. Now, those who were to seize history and move it forward was the Communist Party and the vanguard of the Communist Party. And its leader was the old man, as it's called in the book, which is to say Lenin. And one of Lenin's important uh, lieutenants um, was, number one, uh, Stalin. Now, I should say Stalin, it, it shouldn't have said, I, it's really a misnomer, became its leader, because there were many others, including, of course, Trotsky, and you'll see the limited, um, and Bukharin, who was one of the models for the character we were talking about, and a whole bunch of other people, many of whom, or most, all of whom, actually, were killed uh, in the great purges that I'm going to come to um, in, in a moment. So here is this vanguard party of a group of guys uh, Lenin is an exile who comes back, and they decide they're going to um, they're going to uh, make uh, they're going to take over. They're going to make a revolution. They're going to lead the party forward. And many people on the on the all sorts of places on the left, not just communists, thought yes, and they promised what was going to be a wonderful new world. And so for a time, the, the civil war was a horrible was was a horrible um, version. But these guys basically said, look, look, um, we do not have to wait at the bourgeois station. The train is chugging along. Marx said, we've got to stop at the bourgeois station and produce the bourgeois, bourgeoisie, which is going to tear all this stuff up, which is going to produce it at the class, and then we're going to move on to the next stage. They said, no, we're on an express train. No local stops. So whistles through the bourgeois station to the, to the proletariat station well down the line. They didn't think it was that far down the line. They didn't think it was that difficult to get to it. But basically, that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the idea. And that's the idea that you get in this, so powerfully, um, in this, um, in this, uh, in this, um, um, in this novel about the moving forward of history. And I'm going to come back to the theme um, again and again. So here you have this charismatic number one uh, leading, and we'll come back to the picture in a moment, uh, leading the people um, through the bourgeois station, don't stop, and moving on to the next, the, the, the next, the, the, the next place. Now, um, for a time, right after, the, but there was a civil war, by 1921, um, many of the things that you read about in this book uh, were already um, beginning to happen, and there was rebellions against it. So for many, there's a sort of what they call a Kronstadt moment, which refers to the same city, naval port, in which, in which the initial revolt starting the revolution began, when soldiers and sailors uh, uh, protested again, this time not against the Tsarist regime, but against the, the Leninist regime, claiming that it was, that it was Pushing things too far, too fast, and taking away too many rights. And this rebel, this this was this was this rebellion of these soldiers and sailors um, was repressed. After all, Soviet. The word Soviet meant 
a, a, a local democratic um, body, Union of Soviets. Soviet was a working workers or workers organization, a cell, a workers group. So in, in some ways, it seemed to have democracy built into it, but democracy was inefficient. So Soviet became increasingly less Soviet based on actual individual groups, not soldiers and sailors and workers, but on this vanguard party. Right? So in some sense, people, when this actually went off the track into this thing his book talks about is much debated, some say 21, there was a period in the 1920s in which um, Lenin had realized and that later Stalin and things could not keep going at this rate. They introduced a certain amount of capitalism, they introduced the freedom of artistic freedom. This was the great period of, of, um, of Soviet constructivist art, of, of, of experimentation in poetry. It was a, it was a remarkable uh, uh, period. Um, whether it could have lasted under some other circumstances is not a debate that we can have. In, I mean, it's a huge debate. What, caused it to go wrong? Was it the pressure from the West? Was it, who knows? But the point is only, at some point, when it seemed to someone as a democratic, popular revolution um, uh, became the story that you, that you read about. So let's look at some versions of that, of that um, coming off the track and this um, movement of um, well, the three moments I can talk to you about. One is, is, is forced collectivization, the attack on Kulaks and the Great Famine. So Russia was this country, and you get this in the discussion of Gletkin, Russia was this country of peasants. They'd only been freed from serfdom, um, what, 50, um, uh, 50 years uh, um, uh, before in, 1860, in 1861. Um, much land had been given to peasants, which they farmed by and large in communes or small plots, but they had to pay back, buy back their serfdom, buy back their rights uh, from, a, from, a, uh, from, the former land, from the former landowners. And um, this was not a, a, productive, a productive peasant class. As you got from the book, Gletkin saying, I never got a watch but until I was in the room in the section until I was much older. Peasants used to go to the train station and you wait around all day for the train to come and then you get on the train and you go to market and you wait around all day for the train to come back. That's not efficient. And they were not efficient at every score. It was an old-fashioned, inefficient, um, uh, uh, inefficient uh, uh, agriculture. And if the idea is to have a small, small number of people support more and more people in cities who were engaged in this much more productive work, which is what happened in the West, which sort of defines the Industrial Revolution, you have to move the peasantry along. Moving the peasantry along creates an incredibly brutal um, a, 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 a huge loss of life and, 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 and um, some argue, uh, genocide. So, so what happens is after the revolution, more land is given back to peasants. The number of, of, of holdings amongst peasants almost doubles. But food production um, does increase, not much. But the peasants, now that they're no longer under having to pay back things and save food, start eating it. So they produce 85% of the food in these holdings, but they, but they keep a lot of it, about 80%. So only, only, only uh, what is uh, 45% of the food, 35% of the food actually goes to feed the industrial uh, working class. And so the peasant agriculture is not efficient. It becomes slightly more efficient. But a free peasantry doesn't want to give up its food. So the answer, Stalin's point of view, is we're going to do two things. We're going to attack what they took to be the answer.